Assalamu alaikum and welcome to the first Wessex Jamaat basic life support training session. Thank you all for attending today. We hope that it will be an interesting and worthwhile session for you all. We will start with a recitation from the Holy Quran. Bismillah. <laughs> بغير نفس أو فساد في الأرض فكأنما قتل الناس جميعا ومن أحياها فكأنما أحيا الناس جميعا ولقد جاءتهم رسولنا بالبينات ثم إن كثيرا منهم بعد ذلك في الأرض لمصرفون صدق الله العلي العظيم Translation بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم That is why we ordained for the children of Israel that whoever takes a life unless as a punishment for murder or mischief in the land it will be as if they killed all of humanity and whoever saves a life, it will be as if they saved all of humanity. Although our messengers already came to them with clear proofs, many of them still transgressed afterwards through the land. So the Um the verse that I just chose is the verse that tells us about the importance of saving a life in Islam. And it says, if you save one life, it is as if you have saved all of humanity. And that is what we are here to do, to learn how to save a life. Thank you. Thank you so much for that beautiful recitation. Very relevant, as you say, to the session today. So just a couple of housekeeping points before we get started. Um, because this is the first time we have run this session via Zoom, please bear with us if there are any IT glitches. Um, there'll also be time for questions at the end of the session. So please post any queries or points that you want to make in a Zoom chat function and we will try and answer them all either as we go along or at the end of the session. So just an introduction to the session and why we decided to run this um, session today. Coronary heart disease is the single biggest cause of death in the UK, and there are nearly half a million admissions related to coronary heart disease every year, with over 10% of deaths occurring in the UK population due to this condition. So a cardiac arrest occurs when the heart stops pumping blood around the body, and causes a person to collapse and stop breathing normally. This means that they do not get enough oxygen to their major organs, particularly the brain, the kidneys and the heart. Most cardiac arrests actually occur in the home and in the majority of adults, the cause of cardiac arrest is due to heart disease. The current survival rate for out of hospital cardiac arrests, so those happening in the home, on the streets, in shopping centres, etc., is actually less than one in 10. However, knowing CPR, or what we call cardiopulmonary resuscitation, could mean the difference between life and death for your family and friends. And this is why we are here today, to teach you the basic necessary skills in order to bridge the gap between that moment of cardiac arrest and help arriving in the form of paramedics or other healthcare professionals. Although sudden heart attacks are one of the most common causes of death in the UK, CPR does not always happen in these patients for a number of different reasons. So this may be because the bystander, so whoever else is around, may not know what to do. They may not have learned CPR. They may be worried that they might make things worse than they already are. Or they don't feel comfortable giving mouth to mouth, which is what we typically see kind of on TV programs and things when we think about CPR. But as we will talk about today, the most important part of CPR is actually the chest compression side of things. And especially during the COVID pandemic, your safety will always come first, which is what we'll stress throughout this session. However, knowing how to do these effective chest compressions could save a life. 
So I'm now going to hand over to Mama the Bus and Zainab, who will go over CPR in more detail. Assalamu alaikum, uh, I'm Zainab and I am a foundation doctor at the Queen Alexandra Hospital. Assalamu alaikum, I'm Mohamed Abbas and I'm a GP working in Havens. So now that we've all heard exactly how important CPR is, um, today myself and Mohamed Abbas will go through exactly how to do CPR. So what I'd like to start off by doing is just to set the scene and um, I want you to imagine that situation that we hope none of us ever have to actually face. But imagine that you enter a room and you see someone who is on the floor and appears to be unresponsive. So in this situation, what is the first thing that you need to do? So obviously that person is on the floor and something has happened. It could be that they've slipped, they've tripped. It could be that there's live electricity around or there's a wet floor. What you don't want to do is necessarily rush in and injure yourself in the same process. So take a moment, have a quick look around and just make sure that it's safe to approach. Okay, once you know it's safe to approach and you've gone closer to them, you need to check, are they responding? Um, and how do you do this? So it's quite simple. Firstly, you can just call out to their name and just say, hello, can you hear me? Use their name. Um, if they're not responding to voice, you can even just shake them to see if you get a response from that too. So if they are not responding, you know that you're going to need some help. And so the very next thing that you do uh, is shout for help. The idea is that if anyone is nearby, you want them to be able to hear you and come to your assistance. So don't be shy, use your lungs, a nice, clear, decisive shout for help for some, uh, some support. Okay, now once you have called for help and there is someone on their way coming, you need to now try and help this person who is unconscious. What is the first thing you have to do? You have to check, are they breathing normally? Um, now, the first thing you have to do is um, open up their airway, because especially if somebody is unconscious, um, for example, their tongue could actually be obstructing their airway, and this is quite dangerous. So the way to open up their airway is, as you can see in the photo on the left, something called a head tilt chin lift. The way to do this is place one hand on their forehead and your other hand under their chin and use this to lift their head up. This will then open up their airway. Then you have to check if they are breathing normally. And you do this by looking, listening, and feeling. So look, listen, feel. You have to place your cheek just above their mouth and look towards their chest. So you're looking to see if you can see their chest rising up and down. You're listening to hear if you can hear any breath sounds coming from them. And finally, you're feeling to feel if you can feel any breath from their mouth coming onto your cheek. Do this for a maximum of 10 seconds. And this will help you to establish if they're breathing normally. And when we say normally, we actually mean breathing normally. If they're gasping for breath or um, if they're gurgling, these are not signs of breathing normally. So if they are breathing normally, then you can breathe a sigh of relief. Uh, and the important thing to do in this situation is to protect their, that airway. As Zainab said, when they're unconscious, there is a risk that they, they may not be able to support their own airway. And so the best position to keep their airway safe is known as the recovery position, which we won't go into the details of today. Once you've put them into the recovery position, then that is when you call an ambulance and get further help. Now, what happens if they are not breathing normally? This is when you know it's an emergency situation and you have to do CPR, that is call, push and rescue. So the first thing is to call an ambulance. Uh, and when you when you do that, you need to let them know that you have someone there who's not breathing uh, and they will get an ambulance to you as soon as possible. These days, we all have our mobile phones in our pockets. So a good tip might be just to put your phone on speaker. Um, and then that way, whilst you're speaking to the emergency services, you can actually continue and just crack on with the next step so that you're not wasting any time. So the next step is push. 
So we need to deliver some chest compressions to this person because their heart is not working. And so we need to be the ones to try and get that heart pumping again. So the way to do this is by placing one hand um, on their chest, kind of in the center, so just above their breastbone, and the other hand over that first hand and interlocking your fingers through it. Um, you then have to make sure that firstly your arms are straight and that your shoulders are just over your hands. This will be the best position to be in to deliver the chest compressions at enough strength because you need to do it quite hard. Um, you then push on the chest 30 times uh, and the rate is quite fast, so it's about two compressions per second. And do that 30 times. Once you've done 30 compressions, that's when we get on to rescue breaths. So for this, you open up the airway in the same way that we mentioned before, using your head tilt, chin lift, um, to make sure that airway is open. Then to deliver the breath, you need to first pinch the nose to make sure that there's no air escaping from there. Form a good seal with your mouth around theirs, making sure that making sure there's no leaking air, um, and then deliver a breath. And if you do that, you should be able to see the chest actually rising. Let the chest fall again, and then repeat with one further breath, so that you're doing two rescue breaths. But as Alicia said, if you're not comfortable doing these, or you feel that doing so might be unsafe, for example, for COVID, then you can omit this and just continue with chest compressions. So we have to repeat the cycle of the 30 chest compressions and two rescue breaths, if you feel safe enough to do so, until the person wakes up or until the ambulance arrives. Okay, so that's pretty much the process of CPR. Let's quickly run through it again, just to make sure that you've all got it. So step one, as soon as you see someone who appears to be unresponsive, quick glance around to just make sure it's safe to approach. If it's safe, then you need to approach them and try and find out if they are responding by shouting out to them or asking them uh, if they can hear you, for example, and perhaps a shake on the shoulders. If they're not responding, shout for help. And then you have to check, are they breathing normally? By opening up the airway uh, and look, listen and feel for up to 10 seconds. Okay, so if they are breathing normally, um, then you place them into the recovery position as this will ensure that they're in the position they need to be to keep their airways open and you then call for an ambulance for help. If they are not breathing normally, then you know you have to do CPR, that's the call, push, rescue. So you have to call an ambulance on 999, push on the chest, so that's giving them 30 chest compressions and then giving them the two rescue breaths. And then you have to continue um, the 30 to two um, so the 30 chest compressions and two rescue breaths until the ambulance arrives or until the person wakes up. So this is a useful slide. If you did want to take a screenshot or something like that so that you've got it for reference, then now is the time to do that. Um, and what we'll do next is we're going to do a demonstration where you'll be actually able to see this whole process uh, in practice, um, which I know is a lot easier sometimes than, than going through the theory. OK. OK, so now we're going to go through the demonstration. I'm going to do this two times. The first time I'm going to do it in real time, just so that you can see what this process is supposed to look like in real life. And then I'll do it a second time where I break it down and just explain things as I go along. OK. All right, so the first demonstration is going to be done in real time. Hello, can you hear me? Can you open your eyes? Help, I need some help here. Then I've got someone here who's not breathing. Can you please call an ambulance uh, and let them know I'm starting CPR and then come back here when you're done? Okay, sure.
So, and the paramedic from the ambulance, thank you so much. I'll take over from now. Great. And that's the end of that, our first demonstration. So now I'm going to do the same thing again, but this time we'll go a bit slower and I'll talk you through it. So um, I'm entering and I can see that there's someone here who's who appears to be unresponsive. So before rushing in, I'm going to do a quick glance around just to make sure that it's safe to approach. Assuming it is, I'm going to try and get a response. Hello, can you hear me? Open your eyes. Uh, quick shake on the shoulders. I can see that this person is not responding. So the first thing I need to do, help, I need some help over here. And then once I know help is on its way, then I'm going to go on to checking the breathing. So to do this, we're using our head tilt, chin lifts. So one, for, one hand on the forehead, one hand below the chin, and just tilting the head backwards like that. And that just opens the airway to make sure the tongue is not blocking. Now I'm going to look, listen, and feel. So I'm looking at the chest, I'm listening to see if they're breathing, and I'm feeling with my cheek to check for breathing, for normal breathing for up to 10 seconds. Okay, now I know that this is someone who is not breathing, I need to call an ambulance. If you've got someone with you, like I had in that situation there, then you can ask them to go and call an ambulance whilst you continue, and then ask them to come back. But if you don't, then you can get your mobile phone out, put it on speakerphone, um, call 999 and continue as you're calling the ambulance. So with the compressions, what you need to do is essentially with the heel of your hand, place that on the center of the chest, right in the middle of the breastbone on the bony bit there. Your other hand goes on top, interlocking, so it's like that. And you want to make sure your elbows are nice and locked so that you don't want to be doing this that's not going to work. And similarly, even if you're here, that's not going to work either. What you need to do is keep your arms nice and straight and make sure that your shoulders are directly above your hands so that your weight is going through. And that way you'll be able to deliver effective chest compressions. So that will be done 30 times. Then you go on to your rescue breaths. So once again, head tilt, chin lift to make sure the airway is open. Pinch the nose to make sure that there's no leakage there. And then once you've taken a breath, form a good seal around their mouth and deliver a breath. If done correctly, you should be able to see that chest rise and fall. I'm not sure if you can see it, but that's certainly what I saw there. And that's, and that's how you do it. So whilst you're still waiting for help, you're gonna repeat that cycle, 30 compressions, two breaths. If you're not comfortable with the breathing aspect of it, then just continue with continuous chest compressions um, until either help arrives or they wake up. And if there's more than one of you around, then you can swap so that one of you doesn't, so that you don't get too tired. Uh, and that brings us to the end of the demonstration. We're now going to go over to Nahida to take us through a scenario. Assalamu alaikum everybody. Um, I'm Naida, I'm an F2 at Queen Alexandra Hospital. And I'm just gonna run through with you a scenario that, that possibly could happen to anybody. Um, and just going through again, what uh, Mohibas and Zainab have gone through with us. So let's start. So a man is found collapsed in a shopping mall. So um, a good abbreviation um, is Dr. ABC. So it's basically what um, Mamad Abbas and Zainab have already said. So D is for danger. So just look around, see it's safe to approach. R is for response. Go near the person who's collapsed and see if they're responding to you, call out loudly. And then just the ABC that they mentioned. Okay, so this part is going to be um, uh, an interactive session whereby there'll be a few questions posed and uh, you can unmute yourselves and help answer the questions as we go along. 
So the first question is, what do you do? Uh, do you first check for danger or do you run towards the collapsed person? Check for the danger. Yes, exactly. Thank you. You check for danger and then you approach. It's always good to see on your both sides, like before we cross the road, just to see you're not missing out anything. See if there's nothing around the person that you need to be aware of. What do you do next? Do you keep him warm or do you try and get a response? Try to get a response. Yes, try and get a response. How do you get a response? Do you shake shoulders gently and ask loudly, are you okay? Or do you tap the face gently asking, are you okay? The first one. Yes, you ask very loudly, very clearly, are you okay? The person is not responding. Uh, what do you start with? Do you do CPR or do you open his airway so he can breathe? Open his airway so he can breathe? Yes, first comes A, B and then C. So you make sure that his airway is open. And how do you do that? So it's very important to keep him in the correct position. The person should be flat on their back with the head facing straight up. And then like uh, Zainab mentioned, head tilt and chin lift to make sure that the tongue is not obstructing or there's nothing in the mouth. Okay, what next? Do you look for normal breathing or look, feel and listen for normal breathing? Look, feel, listen for normal breathing. Yes, exactly. Um, so in a normal scenario, that's what we do. We look, feel, and listen. But if you're uncomfortable because of COVID, um, if you just see and just look if the chest is rising and falling, that should give you an indication if the, patient, if the person is breathing normally or not. For how long would you do that? Five seconds or 10? Five, five seconds? Take a guess. Five seconds? No, maybe 10 seconds. 10 seconds. Um, yeah. Just enough to, to make sure that he is not breathing properly. Okay. What do you do now? Do you get him some water and keep him warm? Or do you call for an ambulance mm -hmm. or tell somebody to get a defibrillator or an AED, which is an automatic oh, turn? For the ambulance, right? Yes. It's very important that you shout out for help, like one of the boss mentioned. Um, it would be nice that they come back and tell you that they have already done it. So you know that bit is done. And if you're in a public place, there are always places where you can find a defibrillator. So just trying to look for that can also help. What about if he has chewing gum or something like that in their mouth? Can we take it out? Yes, yeah. yes, yes, yes. Anything that can cause an obstruction. Uh, starting CPR. So they went through with you how we do the, the, the CPR, the chest compressions. That is the main bit. So where do we do it? How do we do, how do we do it and how fast do we do it? So that's just a quick picture whereby it's the center of the chest. Your fingers need to be interlocked and you need to press at least two inches, which is about five to six centimeters uh, depth wise and you need to make sure that you're doing it correctly and you're not afraid to break the person's ribs because it is very important that you press down and then you wait for the chest to recoil and then press again. So how deep do you compress? Anybody? Five to six centimeters? Yes. Five to six centimeters, thank you. So that sums up the CPR. Uh, there are three times when you can stop doing CPR. When there's a healthcare professional nearby who tells you to stop, uh, when you get tired and unlikely, but if it happens, when the person responds and wakes up. So there's a, a video that I'd like to share with you which summarizes everything we've talked about. This is what a normal heartbeat looks like, moments before a sudden cardiac arrest. It can happen anywhere, but you are most likely to be at home. The heart will suddenly stop beating and breathing may be abnormal or stop. Blood won't be being pumped to the brain and other vital organs. It's time to act. Every minute without CPR will significantly reduce their chance of survival. 
shout for nearby help and always check for danger before approaching the person. Shout at them and gently shake or firmly tap their shoulders to check for a response. Check their breathing. Current guidance recommends looking for the rise and fall of their chest. Do not place your ear or cheek close to I can see that it's frozen, so I'm just going to um, stop your screen share. And if you maybe start screen sharing again, that might that might help. Yeah, I'll try that. OK, go for it again. It doesn't seem to be working, so um, maybe we can just uh, see the video at the end if it plays to just summarize everything. Is that okay? Thank you. Thank yeah, you. That's, that's absolutely fine, thanks. Okay, so now we're going to go on to our next presentation, which is all about choking. Okay, so this presentation is all about how to manage a scenario where someone is choking. So I'm going to once again set the scene uh, just so just to, to, to paint a bit of a picture of what's going on. I want you to imagine that you're out having lunch with a friend, uh, having a casual conversation, and then all of a sudden it seems as though something has gone down the wrong way for your friend. Uh, they stop talking all of a sudden, they're holding their neck, they're looking very distressed, and that thought crosses your mind, I think they're choking. So what I'd like you to do is, um, I want you to just, on the chat, write a couple of suggestions as to how you can establish whether or not this person is choking. So we'll give you uh, a few moments just to go on the chat and write a couple of thoughts as to how you figure out whether this person is, in fact, choking. Okay, fantastic. <laughs> if they're going blue. <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah. So yeah, absolutely. So all of the comments that we're getting are, uh, are signs for choking. Um, you might see signs, for example, that they, they are gasping or they're making funny noises with their breathing or, or that they're holding their neck or they're turning color or they're looking distressed. Those kinds of things are definitely signs. The single thing that you can do to just be sure before you proceed any further is very simple. And that's essentially just to ask them, are you choking? Now, if they can say yes, that's a good sign because it means that there's air that's coming through their airway. Even if they can't say yes because there's a complete obstruction there, they'll still be able to nod their head. So you'll be able to, uh, to establish for a fact that they are indeed choking. Okay, so now that you have established that this person is choking, what do you do? So there are three simple steps 
um, that we have to follow that will try and help us in this situation. So the first thing is cough it out. Second is slap it out. And thirdly, squeeze it out. Okay, so with cough it out, the first thing to do is actually to encourage them and ask them if they can cough. So ask them to cough. If they're able to cough, again, that's a good sign. It means that there's some air going in and out of their airways. And if that is the case, then it means that this is something that they can probably sort out on their own. And your job here is just to encourage them as much as you can to just keep coughing until that obstruction comes out. If unfortunately they're not able to cough for any reason, then that is when we move on to the next step. So the next step is to try and slap it out. So the person is not able to cough the obstructed object out themselves, so we need to try and help them do this. So the way to do this is to firstly lean the person forward and support them so that they are able to do this. And then we have to deliver five back slaps. The way to do this is using the heel of your hand, we have to deliver five sharp blows on their back between their shoulder blades. And when I say sharp, I mean sharp. We're trying to get this obstructed object out. So we have to use a lot of force. So it's something like this. And we try and do that five times. If of course on the first or second time they, the obstructed object has come out, you don't, you don't need to carry on. Um, but if it hasn't come out, continue with the total of five. Okay, if you've got to five back slaps and they still are choking, then we go on to squeeze it out. Now with this, what you have to do, this is what we call abdominal thrusts. So you stand behind the person, place a fist just above their belly button and another hand just on top like that. And you need to be squeezing inwards and upwards uh, quite sharply. And the idea is to generate enough pressure to expel that object out. Uh, and you can do that up to five times. Once again, if it comes out the first time, then no need to continue, but otherwise up to five abdominal thrusts. If this still has not resulted and the person is still choking, and um, this is an emergency because they could stop breathing. So we have to call 999, try and get an ambulance as soon as possible. Um, and after when you have called them, in the meantime, repeat the cycle of the five back slaps to five abdominal thrusts. So the five back slaps, five abdominal thrusts. Now, if at any point they become unresponsive, then you need to stop what you're doing and instead go back to our previous session uh, and start CPR. So that means lie them on their back, op open their airway, check if they're breathing. And if they're not, then you need to, again, call an ambulance to let them know that the situation has deteriorated um, and continue with CPR, your chest compressions uh, and rescue breaths um, and continuing that cycle uh, until help arrives or until the person wakes up. Okay, so that's it for choking. So just to summarize, so we've got it all clear. Um, if you think somebody is choking, the first thing we have to do is check if they are choking. And how do we establish this? Something as simple as just asking them, are they choking? Or you could see some of the signs that they're choking as we mentioned previously. Then you have to try and encourage them to cough it out themselves. If they are not able to do this, then we have to try and help by giving them five back slaps. That's using the heel of our hand, doing it quite sharply in between their shoulder blades. After those five, if that, that still has not worked, go into the abdominal thrusts. So that's the five abdominal pushes where we go inwards and upwards, trying to bring that object out. Um, if this has not worked, we need to call 999 to get an ambulance and repeat the cycle of the five back slaps, five abdominal thrusts, and keep going. Thank you. Uh, so that brings us to the end of our presentation. Um, that brings us to the end of our presentation. We're now going to pass over to uh, Masuma, inshallah, to talk to us a bit further about choking. Um, my name is Masma. Um, I'm a general dental practitioner um, and I'm going to be basically going through a scenario for choking. Um, it, this again is an interactive part. So um, I'm going to go through some 
I'm going to go through a scenario and there'll be some questions. So I'd like you to just answer whichever question you think is the right option. Okay, so the scenario is, Rebecca is with her friends and whilst eating on a sandwich, she chokes and has a serious blockage in her windpipe. No air can get in or out of her lungs, so she can't breathe. Unless someone does the right thing, she could be dead in three minutes. You have just walked into the room. Okay, so the first um, part, do you try and help? Yes, always try and help. Yep, great. Okay, the next part, what now? Check for danger, then go to her or run to her? Run. Check for danger, then go to her. Yeah, so similar to the situation with CPR, you just want to make sure that um, you're safe first, and make sure that there's no dangers around and then go to the person to help them. What now? Do you ask, are you choking or do you go straight and give abdominal thrusts? You ask if they're choking. Ta -ta. All right. Okay, what now? You give her some water or you tell her to cough? Uh, tell her to cough. Yeah. So like what the name said, um, you need to try and encourage them um, to cough because most of the time, sometimes when you're eating food, it just goes down the wrong way. And most of the time it's just coughing it out is enough. So at that point, just encourage them, okay? So um, yeah, so you ask the victim if they're choking and ask them to cough. If they can say yes or can cough it out, then things aren't too bad as some air must be getting through their windpipe. If they can't talk or cough, then you know that you have a very serious situation, which is what we have here. So what's next? Do you give them back blows or do you give abdominal thrusts first? Give back blows. Yeah, so yeah, you start with the back blows first. Okay. And how would you go about doing that? Do you stand directly behind her or do you stand to, to her side and slightly behind her? Slightly behind her? So it, you actually stand to her side and slightly behind her, yeah. Okay. The next one, do you, so you lean her forward, how far? Do you lean just, do you lean her just a little bit forward so she can breathe or well forward so the food can fall out? Just a little so she can breathe. So it's actually well forward. So you need to make sure that the food can fall out. Okay, because that's what's causing the blockage. So really important that you do make sure that they lean forward. How do you stop her from falling? Do you hold her short shoulders or do you support her with one hand? With one hand. Support. support her with one hand. Yeah. So, hello, like, um, hello? Hi, sorry. Um, so, yeah, like this, like um, it was said, um, you support her with, uh, you support her quite well because. The back blows, you're not giving them quite, you're not giving them gently. You have to give them quite a bit of force. So you need to support her very well. Okay, where do you aim for? The lower back or between the shoulder blades? Between, between the, the shoulder, shoulder blades. blades. Fantastic. And how do you hold your hand? Is it in a fist or is it a flat, flat. hand? Flat. Yeah, so like they mentioned, it, you use the heel of the hand to um, do the back blows. And how many blows do you give? Is it up to three or up, up to five? To, up to five. Yeah, so up to five. And uh, like it was said, if obviously the food comes out after, let's say three back blows, you don't need to give the other two. You just stop then after the three if you're sure that the blockage has come out. What now? So she's still, there's still a blockage there. So, um, well, sorry. So, yeah, what now? Do you, after you've given the back blows, do you give another back blow or do you check if the food's come out? Give another back blow. What about if you've already given the five back blows? Again. Then check if the food's come out. Yeah, great. Okay. Okay, so now you've done the five back blows. So, what now? Give a. Um, 
backwards. Abdominal thrust. Abdominal thrust. Yeah, so you've done the five back blows, so then you move on to the next part, which is abdominal thrust. So how do you do the abdominal thrust? Do you stand behind her or stand next to her? Stand behind her. Yes. Yeah. yeah, well done. And then where do you put your, well, what do you do next then? Do you put your arms around the upper part of her abdomen or tilt her head upwards? Put your arms around the upper part of her abdomen. Yeah, well done. Um, and then, then what do you do? Do you make her lean forwards or make her stand straight? Make her lean forwards? Yes. Um, so again, that helps just to make sure that the food comes out, the blockage comes out, yeah? What do you do with your hand? Do you make it into a fist or do you keep it flat? Make it into a fist. Yes. And where do you put your fist? Do you put it below her belly button or between the belly button and the bottom of the breastbone? In the belly button and the bottom. Below her belly button. So you put it just between the belly button and the bottom of the breastbone because that's that will help um, remove the blockage. Okay. And what does your other hand do? So if you've got one hand that's a fist, what do you do with the other hand? Get a grasp your fist tightly. Yep, well done. And what now? So do you pull that fist sharply inwards and upwards or do you pull backwards? Pull sharp, sharply inwards and upwards. Yes. And how many times do you do that? Five times. Eight. Yes, five yes. times. Okay, what now? Do you give um, another thrust or do you check if the food comes out? Check, check if, if the, the food, food comes, comes, out. Out. comes out. Yes, yeah. So once you've given the five thrusts, Give back blows. Pull up and check again. Asma, I think we've uh, lost your sound, actually. OK, it, it looks like we've lost your sound, Asma, but um, if you're happy to keep going with the slides, then perhaps um, I'll read out the questions and see if we can get answers uh, from everyone. So, oh, it looks like you're back now. Oh, can you hear me now? Yes, yeah, we can. Oh, perfect, sorry. Um, okay, so Rebecca still has food stuck in her windpipe. What now? Do you tell her friend to phone for an ambulance or do you tell her friend to get some water? Tell her friend to phone for an ambulance. Yes. Yeah. Yep, well done. Um, and then she's unconscious and not breathing properly. So what now? Give five. No, start CPR. CPR. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So once the so once she gets to that point um that where she's unconscious now you don't you stop the back blows and abdominal abdominal thrusts and that's when you start cpr which is what we went through in the first half of this presentation yeah okay that's the end of that um now i'm gonna try and show you a video um about this choking scenario i'm gonna see if it works um so just let me know if you can't see the um video
Can 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 you guys see the video? Uh, we can see the web page. Yeah. Does it say sorry, or is there video clips on there? Uh, we can see the the four options for the four video okay, clips. Okay, perfect. Okay, so I'm just gonna click on the choking one then. Let me know if there's any um, technical issues. That looks disgusting. Seriously, how many of them have you had? It's not that bad. We've had like four on that plate ten minutes ago. Have you seen the kitchen here? No, it's what's in them is dog. <laughs> Sorry, I'm coming to Sarah's birthday on Saturday. Oh, no, I'm not sure about it. No, no, you, I don't think we're gonna go. Is what she's trying. Oh, to come say. on, come on. Rebecca here has a serious blockage in her windpipe. No air can get in or out of her lungs, so she can't breathe. Unless someone does the right thing, she could be dead in three minutes. Now your first choices are the same as in the last crisis, so you know what to do, right? Are you choking? Yes, it's choking! Try to cough. That's right. Ask the victim if they're choking and get them to cough. If they can say yes, or if they can cough at all, then things aren't too bad, because some air must be getting through their windpipe. If they can't speak or cough, then you know you've got a very serious situation, which is what we have here. So, what's next? You can't cough, she's not breathing, she's fucked, you just need to get out of here! She's not saying anything! I've got you, don't worry! To give a sharp blow, just press letters Z and M on your keyboard at the same time. this way this will work right you've seen this on tv the americans sometimes call it the heimlich maneuver but in the uk the correct term is abdominal thrusts stand behind the person put your arms around them and pull
Okay, to pull up sharply inwards and upwards, just press the letters A and L on your keyboard at the same time. No, sorry. You've done five abdominal thrusts and Rebecca's still choking. Now you switch back to doing up to five back blows. So try that again. You've got it. If the abdominal thrusts don't work, you give up to five more back blows, though we're running out of time. Okay, so I hope that video helped. Um, it was just basically to show you how it works and you can see how much um, force that you have to put on when someone is choking. Thank you. So I think that video, at least definitely for me, makes it a little bit more real because you can see how it happens in just a normal scenario where you're kind of sat around a dinner table eating and then suddenly someone starts choking. So, and obviously you can see how frightening it was. So, and, and very, very intense and very fast paced. So knowing what to do in that scenario is crucial to saving a life. So we really hope the advice we've given you today has helped you feel a bit more reassured that if you were in that scenario, that you would be able to kind of manage and um, get help and know what to do. Um, so we're just going to spend a little bit of time now just going over a couple of the questions that have been mentioned in the chat um, and if you've got any more questions please do post them in the chat and we'll try to answer them um, now as well. Um, so the first question, um, what is the implication of doing CPR on someone who is later found to have a DNA CPR in place? So a DNA CPR is essentially a legally binding document um, which states that CPR, so the chest compressions and all the interventions associated with it, should not be performed on a person, either because they've decided in advance for whatever reason that they do not want it, or because healthcare professionals have decided that it would be futile. Um, and this is a decision that's not taken lightly. Um, it has to be um, kind of signed and co-signed by senior doctors. Um, so it's a very important decision to be made if it is made. But if you do not know for certain that a DNA CPR is in place, then always perform CPR. There will be no negative implications for yourself um, in terms of either kind of legally or ethically, because the, the right thing to do is always to perform CPR and save a life if you don't know, because if they don't have a DNA CPR, if you're unsure, or if they, for example, have had one in the past but don't have a current valid one, then you may not save a life where you could. 
but if you do know for absolute certainty that they do have a DNA CPR, and this is often mostly the case in hospitals, for example, then you should never do CPR as it does count as kind of assault or even battery. Um, but kind of in the general public, unless you know for certain that they have one, even if you've got family members saying, you know, don't do it, if you're if you're uncertain at all, I would always say do CPR. The next question, um, do you check for a pulse before starting CPR? So in medical environments, so hospitals, GP surgeries, et cetera, so the protocol that um, professionals are taught are to check for a pulse as well as checking for breathing. However, for the general public, so for non-medically trained individuals, um, the general advice is to focus solely on breathing because it's a, lot, it's a lot more difficult to check for a pulse accurately than it is to check to see whether someone is breathing or not. Um, and in the majority of cases, a patient who isn't breathing is very unlikely to have a pulse, except on a very rare occasion. Um, if in, you know, on the rare occasion that you assess a patient um, and you think they aren't breathing adequately, um, They'll always, they'll always kind of stop and, you know, a patient who is alive and breathing and has a pulse will not let you do CPR, essentially, because it's, it's very painful for them if they can feel it. So you check the breathing and then start CPR if there's no response. So the next question, um, do you need to call an ambulance or go to hospital as a norm after abdominal thrusts? to ensure that no damage has been caused? So this is a really good question. Um, firstly, choking in itself, if it goes on for longer than a couple of back blows or a couple of coughs, so if it continues as it did in the video and even progresses on to kind of the CPR stage of things where they stop responding, um, choking in itself um, can limit the amount of oxygen going to the organs in the body. So that's one reason to get checked out by a medical professional. Um, so for example, calling an ambulance, going into hospital, depending on how worried you are. Um, and secondly, the actions that you do. So the abdominal thrusts, even the back blows, so particularly in younger patients or the elderly patients where a single back blow um, can cause things like rib fractures and also abdominal thrusts. So the amount of pressure you're putting on the abdominal organs can also cause abdominal damage. So we would always recommend getting some advice from a healthcare professional, be it calling 999 and getting an ambulance or going into hospital, depending on how stable the patient is. So the answer to that is yes. So are there any more questions? You're very welcome to either post in the chat or to unmute yourself and ask the questions. We'd be very happy to answer them. Um, hello. Hello. Yeah. Yeah. That question. Yes. Um, on the choking one, um, yeah. I noticed that the ambulance was called quite late in the stage where you have tried all the other um, stages unsuccessfully. Should you not have the uh, the know how in how to do that? Should you call the ambulance first so you still continue doing the processes of elimination? So in that scenario, so in, with choking in particular, it's a very yeah. again, fast moving scenario. And in that case, I think the gentleman who came to help um, did know how to do the abdominal thrust, etc. I think as I think, as you pointed out, it would be he, he could have told one of the friends to have called a, the paramedics or an ambulance sooner, um, because even if you know she had recovered sooner, there's no harm in calling them because she'd need, she might need a check over anyway. Um, okay. But particularly if you're unsure about what to do in that scenario, then I would say always call for help, call, call an ambulance. And particularly if you're by yourself with a patient as well. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Sorry, I cut off a little bit, but thank you. Yes. No worries. Okay, so there's a couple of questions about the current issue with coronavirus and the current COVID climate. So whether you'd give mouth to mouth in patients considering the current issue um, and how would go about such situations in, in the current COVID climate generally. Um, 
which is a very good question and as you know healthcare professionals in hospital as well all the guidance has changed for us because as, as you might recall from the earlier sessions that we talked about um, we always talk about kind of checking for danger and checking for response and it's always about putting your own health and safety first I think if you were in your own home and a friend or a family member collapsed and it was kind of about doing mouth to mouth to them firstly I mean, you'd probably know about their covid status and secondly if it was someone you knew that closely I don't think you'd hesitate in giving mouth to mouth if it could save their life um, but particularly when you're out and about if it's someone you don't know at all there's a risk not only of you know with coronavirus and contracting COVID-19 um, but also contracting other conditions that they may have that you won't know about. As I mentioned earlier the most important thing is doing the chest compressions and getting help um, and getting the paramedics there soon. So the other thing we haven't really talked about today um, are kind of the electric shocks, so defibrillation, which can also really help if it's done early on. So it's all about getting the paramedics there early um, and doing the chest compressions to get blood pumping around the body. Um, some places and some people do offer kind of special mask filters um, that you can use if you want to do mouth to mouth, but I would say always put your own safety first, um, do what you can to help but don't ever put yourself in danger, be it in terms of contracting something like COVID or if you're in a scenario or a situation where you don't feel safe. So for example, if someone's been electrocuted and you can see live wires, I don't, don't approach and don't put yourself in harm's way, just call for help, if that answers that question. So and another question, um, if the airway is obstructed while choking and the patient becomes unconscious, would there be an occasion where CPR is dangerous and rescue breaths are not able to work? Um, so in that situation, um, the, the, so essentially the airway is completely obstructed and oxygen isn't getting around the body and blood flow isn't getting around the body either. Um, so CPR wouldn't be dangerous because it's the only, at that, that stage, the patient, the patient is, has essentially um, stopped circulating blood around the body and their heart has stopped pumping because of the lack of oxygen. So CPR is the only thing that you can do to save their life at that stage. Um, some people, you know, there is some evidence that have said that CPR can actually dislodge whatever's been kind of choked on, so the food that's been kind of choked on. So it can actually help in that scenario. Um, in terms of rescue breaths, the airway, so the, the tube going from your mouth all the way into your lungs is completely blocked or obstructed. Um, you're very unlikely to be able to get rescue breaths in. It's always worth trying, but at that stage, um, it's about calling for help and getting an ambulance there as soon as possible and then continuing CPR. Just having a look at the next couple of questions. There's a question about um, uh, whether these uh, procedures are the. I'll just turn on the video. There's a question about whether these procedures are the same on young children uh, and babies, um, or whether there are different steps. Uh, whether there are different steps for uh, you know children and babies. So for choking, any for anyone over the age of one, uh, the process is the same. Do take care with the amount of force that you're using, for example, if you're if you're um, helping young children, for example. Um, for babies under the age of one, the, the process is a little bit different. Um, rather than go through the whole process today, um, uh, I think the, the, the basics are what we've shown you through, you know, back slaps and abdominal thrusts for choking, uh, and that can be adapted for children. For, for babies under the age of one, uh, the back slaps are the same. Um, essentially what you do for, for babies, and I can show you using our little dummy here, is you, um, uh, if you're sitting down, you kind of lean them forward so that they're actually uh, face down over your lap, and then you can do the back slap um, in that way. Um, and then rather than doing abdominal thrusts, it is chest thrusts, which is done with two fingers. So they'll be face up, again, on your lap, 
using two fingers, you can press in the middle of the chest firmly, and that would be the chest thrusts that you do instead of the abdominal thrust. Again, with, ba with babies, you're not going to be able to ask them to cough. So instead of cough it out, slap it out, squeeze it out, it's going to be just a case of uh, five back slaps and then five chest thrusts. But we will be um, circulating uh, in, uh, by email uh, after this uh, a video which uh, goes through that whole process and you can actually see it happening on the video as well. Uh, for CPR, again, um, the process is very similar. What I'd, what I'd suggest is that actually, if you use the fundamentals of adult CPR and just ensure that you're using the appropriate amount of force for children, then uh, that is absolutely fine. There is a slight modification for children as well, where you start with five rescue breaths before actually doing the, uh, before going into chest compressions. But once again, we will circulate a video which has a bit more information because um, I don't want to necessarily confuse everybody uh, by going through the whole process now. Thank you for that. We've got another question. What if the person that is choking is much bigger than you and there is no one else around? It may be difficult to administer back blows supporting them, let alone doing abdominal thrusts. So what would you do in this situation? Um, this is actually a really good question. So in terms of physical ability, because it's extremely true. Um, so it's even talking about CPR, CPR is one of the most tiring things you can do. So after doing kind of just two minutes of chest compressions, you may feel exhausted. Um, and one of the criteria for stopping CPR with a patient is actually that you reach the point of exhaustion and that can happen very quickly if there's no one else around. Um, and it's exactly the same for choking. So you can only do your best. So um, in terms of administering back, back blows, so trying to get them to kneel on the ground, for example, if they're much taller and bigger than you, or even kind of sit on a stool or a chair or anything that comes to mind when you're in that scenario. So anything that might be able to help you um, administer the back blows and the abdominal thrusts. Abdominal thrust, in a, you know, you need to be able to fit your arms around the patient and if they're much bigger than you, you might not be able to do that, in which case just continue with the back blows and if they reach the point of collapse then start CPR. Um, but in that scenario in particular, I would say it's definitely a time to call for help early. So um, as we mentioned earlier, um, call the paramedics, keep your phone on loudspeaker and get them there as soon as possible um, because doing things this by yourself will be extremely difficult. Uh, just to add very briefly, I, I know that some people, when they think about managing choking, they think about the kind of Mrs. Doubtfire situation or what they've seen in the movies and, you know, that where the abdominal thrusts are like literally carrying the person like that. Um, that's, you know, that's not how abdominal thrusts are done. You don't need to be carrying their whole weight. It's a case of just that sharp inwards and upwards, um, you know, movement to try and uh, expel the air out. So to some extent, you will be able to do this for people who are much bigger or, uh, for example, yeah, much bigger than you. Um, but yeah, don't feel that you need to actually be able to support their weight. Um, and we had another question that's just come in as well. Um, the question was, it's a very good question. As a Muslim, are we allowed to give mouth to mouth to an off to the opposite gender? Um, so with this, if it's, if it's in a case where it will save a life, it, it, it is a life-saving procedure, it's okay to do so if we think that, you know, this is something that will save a life. So even, you know, with the chest compressions and things, there will probably be some contact, but um, it's okay to do so if, if it will mean we'll be saving a life. Okay, I can't see any more questions. If there's anyone else who's got any questions, um, feel free to unmute yourselves now, or we'd be very happy to answer any questions that you do have um, if you want to email us. Um, at that's absolutely fine as well and we'd be very happy to answer any questions that you might have. Um, so we'll now bring our session to a close. We just wanted to say thank you so much for joining us this afternoon um, for bearing with us when we had glitches within Zoom but we hope we can learn from it today. Um, we hope it's been useful. We'd appreciate any feedback that you might have, any comments, any questions as well as I mentioned. Um, so inshallah we'll be emailing out a feedback form and a summary of what we've covered in the next couple of days. Um, so if there are no more questions, um, we'll bring the session to the close. Um alaikum alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you, Shusta. Thank you, guys.